Edmond Dantes, more famously known as the Count of Monte Cristo and the hero of the novel of the same name, is one of literature's clearest examples of a scapegoat. Unfairly accused by jealous rivals of a crime he didn't commit, he is condemned to life imprisoned in the horrible Chateau d'If. However, there is an even more infamous scapegoat, and he has not been unfairly accused. But instead, he has tried to point the blame of sorrow and suffering on the innocent. Stay tuned. In this episode of Harvest, we will explore who the scapegoat in the Bible is. In the Bible, a scapegoat is one pair of kid goats that is released out into the wilderness or the desert, taking with it all the sins and impurities of the congregation, while the other kid is sacrificed. The concept first appears in the book of Leviticus, in which a goat is designated to be cast out into the desert, carrying away the sins of the community. The word Azael is the first word used to describe this scenario in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8. It literally translates into English as removal from the Lord or the one that is taken away from God. In 1530, William Tyndale, the first person to translate the Bible into English, coined a singular English word for this literal translation, scapegoat. However, unlike the biblical meaning, the modern definition of scapegoat is not what Tyndale intended. Today, people think of a scapegoat as someone who is innocent and takes the blame. However, the biblical meaning and Tyndale's purpose for the word scapegoat is one that is bearing the blame for sins he has caused others to commit. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Those who have confessed their sins will have their sins buried forever. God pleads with us, Repent then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. In 1 John chapter 1, Verse 7, God tells us that if we have accepted his gift and chosen to follow his way, his blood will cover our sins. Our part is to accept his sacrifice, confess our sins, and to claim his power to walk in a newness of life. In the earthly day of atonement service, there was a scapegoat. This animal symbolically received the sins of the sanctuary and carried them out into the desert wilderness. 
in the final cleansing of sin from the universe, there will also be a final scapegoat. Satan, the arch deceiver, will bear the sins of the righteous. He will take the blame for the sins he has tempted them to commit. When the sanctuary in heaven is cleansed, those sins are transferred to Satan. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, it speaks of an angel who will lay hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bind him for a thousand years. Satan will have 1,000 years on a desolate earth to think about all the sins he has tempted God's people to commit. He will have 1,000 years to realize the enormity of the consequences of sin. At the end of this time, Satan and the unrighteous, who did not accept God's atoning gift of salvation, will be destroyed. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 21 says this destruction is called God's strange act. Why? 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 tells us why. God is not willing that any should perish. He longs that all should come to repentance. God longs to save all of his human family. Jesus' sacrifice is powerful enough to save each and every one of us, but he respects each person's freedom to choose. Once Christ finishes his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, the eternal destiny of every person will have been decided. The sanctuary in heaven will be cleansed, and the earth will be purified from sin. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, God promises he will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. I long to have my sins covered by the blood of the Lamb and transferred to the scapegoat. I believe. Do you believe? Thanks for watching. Please like and share, and don't forget to subscribe.